Okay. So, despite all the hype surrounding natural selection, we come to this humble conclusion that within limits, selection can refine existing characteristics, but it can't invent, okay? It can take um, existing structures, whether it's a protein structure or even an organismal structure, and it can do slight modifications of what is already there, but it will never come up with something new altogether. This is, again, is very much along the lines of what Mike said, in fact. I have a slide that's similar to one of Mike's. <laughs> this is actually familiar stuff that you can get an amazing variety of not just dogs, but lots of different species, including plant species and you know, cabbage and broccoli and things that we eat, corn. Um, but you can only do it within limits. All of these, as, as different as these uh, dogs are, they're all dogs, right? And they're even very obviously recognizable as dogs. And it's also true that if you took any one of these breeds, like if you took only purebred German Shepherds, you could not reproduce this sort of variation, right? You'd only get German Shepherds, right? If you took any one breed, will breed true, and you'll not reproduce this sort of variety. You only get this kind of variety because the wild dog species that humans started to domesticate had a great amount of genetic variety within them, and all that we were doing as we domesticated and as we, as we built these breeds is choosing out aspects that we want in a breed, right? And some of these breeds, by the way, would not do very well. That, that guy would not do well against wolves, would he? So you wouldn't have found that in the wild, but you have the potential for making chihuahuas and, and small dogs and all these things in the natural wild dog populations. But once you've, once you've purified out one version, you've lost that variation and there's no way to get back that variation, okay? Again, you're losing things, which is what Mike was talking about, not gaining things. This is actually not new. The idea that, that natural selection does not explain invention has been around for a long time. Uh, people have been saying it ever since Darwin's day, and yet it keeps being ignored. So people have to re-say it over and over and over again. In my book, I quote um, Hugo de Vries, who wrote a book in 1904 where he was quoting a friend as saying, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. That has kind of a nice sound in English. I'm not sure if it makes it into Portuguese, but it rhymes in English. It probably doesn't in, in Portuguese. But that became a phrase that has been repeated many times. Um, natural selection explains survival of the fittest. It does not explain arrival of the fittest. Uh, even as recently as 2014, a Swiss biologist named Andreas Wagner wrote a book that was titled Arrival of the fittest that was addressing this problem that has never been solved. And he says in that book, natural selection can preserve innovations, but it cannot create them, which is ex exactly what we're saying here. So, um, I think the title of my talk was How We Know That Proteins Were Designed. And you might say, well, Doug, you've only shown us that they didn't evolve. You haven't shown us that they were designed. But I go back to um, something that I said in, in yesterday evening's lecture, if you were there. Um, really, when you eliminate, um, there, there's, there's a logic here that allows us to eliminate not just Darwin's explanation for enzymes, but all accidental explanations of enzymes. And it works like this. In yesterday evening's lecture, I had a picture of a, a bird here, of a crane, but let's put an enzyme here instead because it's the same thing. When we look at something like this and we realize that someone had to know how you arrange the amino acids in order to get this to work, then we attribute it naturally to genius. 
Somebody knows how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And in fact, after decades and decades of very smart scientists uh, studying all kinds of proteins, we still cannot uh, author amino acid sequences that fold into functional proteins. We still don't know how to solve this problem. It's called the protein folding problem. It remains unsolved. So somebody brilliant knows how to do this. When we look at things like this, we naturally intuit that, that genius is behind this. So anyone who wants to claim otherwise is claiming that accidental causes just happen to do the work of genius. And because those two causes are so very different, polar opposites, that could only be true by a remarkable coincidence, a fantastic coincidence, even an implausible coincidence. Probability is the math of coincidence, and when you do the math on this, it turns out that that's just not possible. The only way to avoid this problem of coincidence is to reject accidental causes and to affirm that these things look like they were designed because they were designed, okay?